Good morning, everyone. My name is Herbert Hofer. I'm the director of the Leibniz Institute for Zoo and Wildlife Research, and I've been chosen by the organizers to uh, chair the coming session. This is going to be uh, a session where some showcases of animal, uh, applied animal welfare research is being done, because we felt it would, it would be necessary and helpful to show some of the cutting edge of the research that is being done, mostly in connection with zoos. Uh, I've never chaired a session before, where the authors are uh, presenting in alphabetical order, so this is going to be an interesting situation. We have a tight schedule, and I will have to um, make sure that the uh, present, uh, presenters not overrun their time. So, in alphabetical order, then, the first one, Faye Clark, is from the Bristol Zoological Society. She's a veterinarian, and she's going to tell us something about cognitive challenges in animal welfare. Right. Hello everyone, uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, I feel actually that my talk is going to lead on quite nicely from what Temple was talking about, so that's, that's really great, although she's such a tough act to follow, so oh, I feel the pressure already. Okay, so um, this idea of um, stimulating the cognitive skills as a way of enhancing welfare is basically what I'm going to talk about. Um, so my research area is this tiny sliver here, um, that's found between the two disciplines of animal cognition and um, captive care, um, so essentially just how we look after our animals, and specifically zoo animals I'm talking about here. Um, and if you imagine, I guess, the analogy of maybe two atoms coming together in a sort of chemical sense, um, hopefully when they come together and they've fused, you know, there's a lot of energy and excitement created and hopefully not too much tension. So um, my life's work, I guess, is to try and bring these fields closer together and, and bring them together in a way that kind of creates energy and excitement and is useful in some way. So the main question that underlies my research is, can cognitive challenges enhance welfare? And there is actually plenty of research coming from the laboratory and farm animal literature that suggests that this is the case, um, but it's not really been applied to zoo animals so much yet. Uh, but it is going that way, as I'll explain. Um, I don't have any citations on these slides. Um, that's merely just because I think they look horrific um, and it takes up a lot of space. But trust me, you can trust me. There is um, evidence, scientific evidence to support this, and I can, I can certainly um, give you the references afterwards. So if we uh, whiz through these. Um, so the first fundamental thing is that we know that animals will seek challenges. So um, aside from the challenges that we give them uh, purposely, actively, animals will go out in into their environment and try and seek their own challenges. Um, so challenges that we're not providing, but almost the animal wants to provide to itself. The second thing is that we know that animals will work for free. I'm sure you're all aware of the term contra-free loading. So animals will work for food even when free food is concurrently available. Um, there's a really interesting uh, recent study on beagle dogs um, to suggest that some animals experience what we call the eureka effect. And that's um, basically when you get that feeling of satisfaction when you've solved a problem spontaneously. It's also been demonstrated in cattle. Um, looking at the human literature, we know uh, just from our own personal experiences that engaging in cognitive challenges, if successful and at the right level, can increase our well-being. And you may be familiar with the term flow, which is a sense of satisfaction and absorption in a task when it is at the right level, which just basically makes us feel good. And that's something that I would love to study in non-human animals. Um, we know that animals that are... Um, kind of exposed to cognitive challenges over many weeks and months can uh, have improved social behaviours and exploratory behaviours. And finally, there's a really nice link between cognitive challenge uh, exposure and protection against dementia or cognitive decline. So by no means can doing crosswords and stoku puzzles stop you from getting dementia. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is there's literature to support the idea that you can delay the onset of cognitive decline if you keep your brain challenged. So with all of that brilliant evidence, um, it kind of seems surprising to me that cognitive challenges are not more apparent and not more kind of emphasised in a captive setting, um, specifically with zoo animals. And I think the four main reasons why we're not really, why we're slow on the uptake of this literature and translating it to zoo animal welfare, uh, these are the reasons I think 
are kind of um, the main ones. The first one is that we do have a, la a lack of cognitive knowledge, fund fundamental cognitive knowledge of most exotic taxa. So most of the animals that we house in zoos, we don't really fundamentally understand how their cognitive skills work, let alone the kind of uh, the brink, that, that point at which you are really, really challenging their cognition which means that we have to make a lot of inferences from other taxa. Um, we're trying to draw inferences from... We've got a hippo, and we're trying to work out maybe what a pig would do because we have pig literature, but we don't have hippo literature, and we're making all of these kind of tenuous links. The second thing is that the level of challenge, the level of cognitive challenge, is something that's very difficult to get right in a captive setting. And we know from the great ape literature, both in zoos and in labs, that frustration can occur when the level of challenge that we're providing as a cognitive task um, is too high. So when the animal is not kind of able to solve that problem, when they're making a lot of errors, or they fundamentally just don't understand the task, frustration can creep in. Uh, top right, one of the main things that I come across is the idea that staff are concerned about what cognitive enrichment is, what cognitive challenge is. They're scared of it. They can't get their heads around the idea of how to practically incorporate that into everyday life. They think it's expensive, expensive and they feel like it fundamentally needs computer technology, which it actually doesn't, um, but there is that kind of perception. And then finally, just my major bugbear, is the fact that we have such few um, validated welfare indicators for most of our exotic species. So it's all very well trying to develop cognitive challenges, but if you don't have the validated welfare indicators to, uh, to show that those challenges are having a, a good impact on welfare, then it's kind of pointless. So that type of research that we were talking about um, yesterday is very important, the fundamental validation of indicators. So uh, the idea of what I try and do and, and the advancement that I'm pitching to you, I guess, today is, is the, the concept of con cognitive enrichment. So that's practically putting cognitive challenges into the environment, um, trying to enhance zoo animal welfare. Now, cognitive enrichment doesn't really have a proper definition. Um, I tried to come up with one that was a bit rubbish <laughs> back in 2011 which is up on the screen for you. So I was basically trying to show that you need to uh, stimulate cognitive skill, but you also need to correlate that to an enhancement in welfare. Um, and just to end on the positive, really, so this is actually the work that we're doing in cognitive enrichment in zoos today. So this is um, examples of very recent or current research that's going on. A lot of the people that are doing this research are in the audience today. So the first stuff is stuff that I did for my PhD um, at the Zoological Society of London um, on chimpanzees, also some work on dolphins out in California, using uh, pipe mazes, so very, very abstract mazes that animals had to navigate objects through. Those worked very, very well without food rewards. Uh, the second, um, the idea that your cognitive challenges don't have to be static, so work uh, by Jason Waters and Bethany Krebs at San Francisco Zoo uh, creating this amazing sort of computerized mobile cognitive challenge that moves around um, for Rhino. Then we have um, all the really good work going on. An example would be Lincoln Park Zoo, where they're doing cognitive research on their primates, but concurrently seeing whether participation in that research is having an impact positively on welfare, and it appears that it is. Uh, the fourth one, the idea that we don't always need to provide physical challenges um, Social cognition can be very enriching as well, so there's studies going on at the moment at Edinburgh Zoo on that. Um, Sally is going to talk um, during this session just after me as well, uh, talking about Melbourne Zoo research on orangutans, building computerised interactive games uh, for the apes. And finally, the, the research that I'm doing at the moment at Bristol Zoo is looking at the idea that we might be able to uh, use cognitive training or, or kind of enhancing and training up the cognitive skills of um, our zoo animals to eventually uh, reintroduce them to the wild. So not only can it kind of um, immediately impact their welfare, but also thinking more long-term about their welfare and enhancing their ability to survive. 
Um, so I've kind of done the wrong thing. Sorry, I've <laughs> missed the brief. Um, I thought I'd just put some things up on there that we could talk about, but I don't think we actually have time. Uh, so if you want to grab me at coffee or buy me a beer later, that would be most appreciated. Um, so I have loads of questions, even myself, and I'm always very critical about my own sort of research interests. Uh, so these are just some of my thoughts. And yes, um, thank you. Thanks for listening. And although we are under a tight schedule, we still want to receive questions and we'll find a way of trying to get the answers out to you. Next one in the alphabetical list is Professor Paul Hemsworth. He is the director of the Animal Welfare Science Center, which is a groundbreaking enterprise of several universities, including the universities of Melbourne, Adelaide, and actually also Ohio State University. And he's going to tell us something about keeper zoo animal relationships. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, a 10-minute presentation is a cognitive challenge, <laughs> so I'll handle it. Um, so I, I want to talk about a model of uh, keeper zoo animal relationships. Um, there's a number of models out there. Jeff Hosey has presented the idea of a uh, model of the human-animal relationship in zoos, uh, loosely based on some of the research that's been done in the livestock industries. And I want to propose this model. It's a bit more comprehensive than what Jeff has proposed, and it utilises some of the more recent developments in the livestock industries. And uh, it's a conceptual model uh, that we can test uh, to demonstrate the utility of it. Um, the theory underlying this conceptual model uh, is a theory of planned behaviour. That's central to it. And... Uh, the theory of planned behaviour, this is a very busy slide, and I've got a few more busy slides, so I'm just preparing you for them. Um, basically, when we think about attitudes, and attitudes are the, the most direct determinant of our intended behaviour, three very important components of attitudes, um, beliefs, relevant beliefs, uh, and the associated attitudes associated with the behaviour that we're interested in, um, we really need to be... But that we really need to be behaviour specific here. We need to talk about the specific behaviours that we're focused on. So it's the attitude towards the behaviour. Um, subjective norms are really the beliefs about others' expectations in, this, in relation to this particular behaviour. And then perceived behavioural control. Um, just how much control we have in terms of that particular behaviour. And so that's a key determinant of our intended behaviour. Now, we've done extensive studies uh, in the livestock industries, our group, over the last three decades, and uh, the, the specific attitudes that we've identified that appear to be associated with some of the key behaviours of stock people that influence animal welfare and productivity are the following. Stock person attitudes towards interacting with the animal, so interacting with the animal, and stock person's attitudes towards working with the animal. So we're really talking about care and management behaviour. Their beliefs about other people's expectations in relation to these behaviours and uh, the, their perceived control around performing these behaviours. And these attitudes in turn determine the nature and extent predominantly of the stock person's interactions with the animals. And in situations where the stock person's interactions with animals are poor, then through fear and stress, we'll often see uh, limitations to, uh, to both welfare and productivity. And there's a substantial amount of evidence for that, both in the field situation and in experimental settings. Now, this is, a, this is my very, very busy slide. Uh, I apologise for it. Um, basically built around the theory of uh, planned behaviour, um, so that our attitudes towards the behaviour, the subjective norms towards the behaviour and the perceived behavioural control are key determinants of how we interact with our animals, but also how we manage our animals in terms of nutrition, monitoring, health care, enrichment, etc. The other interesting thing is that many of our studies in the field have shown that these attitudes are related to things like job satisfaction and work motivation. And we know that work motivation is a key determinant of uh, translating our skills and knowledge into improved work performance. Uh, we also find in a number of our studies that work motivation is associated with motivation to learn and therefore 
with implications on technical skills and knowledge. And so in these situations where the interactions uh, are poor or where the care behaviours, the management behaviours are poor, uh, through, uh, behaviour, through behavioural and physiological responses, uh, through uh, stress, for example, and fear, we see limitations in terms of welfare and productivity. And as I said, there's a sub substantial amount of evidence for that in the livestock industries. Now, just very quickly, and I've just lost track of time, um, we've done a number of studies in the livestock industries to demonstrate that if we can target these key attitudes and behaviours that the research has uncovered, then we can actually change attitudes and behaviours with, uh, with, with consequent changes on, uh, uh, on the, the uh, fear responses in animals, for example, um, stress responses and productivity. So we, ch we use cognitive behavioural intervention, so we target these key beliefs and these key behaviours, and then we try to ch maintain those change beliefs and behaviours. And you need, to, you need to target both. If you target one, uh, the system will probably revert back to the original. And so a number of studies over several years in a number of livestock industries where we've looked at interventions at the farm level um, involving cognitive behavioural intervention and the controlled treatments, measurements before and after in terms of attitudes, behaviours, fear, animal productivity, for example. And this is just one study involving, uh, it's about a, it's 100 farms involved in this study over two years. Uh, and this is, just the oops, this is just the changes that we see in the uh, uh, training treatment, the, tra the uh, intervention program relative to the control improvements in a range of uh, uh, subscales of attitudes around some of these uh, key attitudes that I'm talking about. We see improvements. We see marked reductions in negative behaviours used by stock people. Uh, we see uh, reductions in fear. We see uh, reductions in uh, milk cortisol concentration in these dairy cattle, and we see improvements, sustained improvements in productivity. So, I mean, given the consistency uh, of these relationships across a range of farm animal species, and remember, a range of farm animal species in small farms, large farms, in farms where there's a range of uh, the production or housing systems, um, we see consistent results. And it raises the question of uh, the relevance of uh, this model for other captive animal settings, such as zoos. And it provides a useful framework uh, for, for examining the utility of this model and therefore improving our understanding of uh, zookeeper, zoo animal relationships. So we can develop a similar sort of framework uh, for zoo animals. And indeed, there's already quite a bit of evidence that would support this model. Um, but it's an empirical question. I think we need to evaluate it. Uh, thank you. We have time. Oh, I should have gone longer. <laughs> <laughs> he actually managed um, to finish the talk in seven minutes. My goodness. Um, so I think on behalf of the audience, one question that is obviously... I must get a prize for that. <laughs> Will I? I'm not so sure. The only one in the conference. So, so one question, one obvious question is the, the zookeeper community is a tightly knit community. Can you really run a study where you have one lot that you keep un, uh, as control group who are not benefiting from the cognitive training that the others get um, and the, avoid them speaking to each other? in the way that you can do this with agricultural people? Okay, okay. Well, the, the Cognitive Behavioural Intervention Program, and psychologists use this in a whole range of settings, is a very systematic attempt to target mm -hmm. some of those key attitudes, you know, those three components, as well as the behaviours involved. We've done Cognitive Behavioural Intervention Programs, both within farms and between farms. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think you can. I mean, there may be a little bit of uh, transmission of information, but uh, no, I think you can do it. But the first step is actually to look at the relationships in the field setting, um, identify what those, those key attitudes are and what are those key behaviours associated with, for example, uh, uh, risks to animal welfare, and then uh, apply a, in an experimental setting the Cognitive Behavioural Intervention Program. Right. Uh, anybody else with any more questions, please let them come to us and he's going to be around for a while. Okay. I agree, you should avoid that, but if we can get the attitudes right, then we can deal with those situations to some extent. Well, we, okay. it's a welfare risk. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Paul, thank you very much. Good. Thank you. I'll take my water.
Next in our list of luminaries is uh, Dr. David Powell. He's now the director of research at St. Louis Zoo. He was formerly at Bronx, where he um, worked on, uh, was the keeper for ungulates, carnivores, and similar things. Uh, and he's going to tell us something about lifetime reproductive planning. Where are you? I'm here. <laughs> we'll stick to my notes so I can hopefully stay on time. You might need that. I've pocketed it. Oh, thank you. I just took up some of my time. Um, I'm going to talk about a relatively new endeavor that we're working on in the AZA Reproductive Management Center and at the, the St. Louis Sioux that we call Lifetime Reproductive Planning. And conceptually, what we mean by this is developing a, re a reproductive plan for all the individuals in our populations that spans their entire uh, reproductive lifespan. So you might think of this like human preventative health plans. So when children are born, there's a vaccination plan, there's a series of exams they go through as they grow up. We get our health assessed periodically throughout our lives and then when we get older we get to endure things like endoscopies to make sure we're still healthy and all that. So this is kind of like that but hopefully not that invasive. So why are we doing this? Well our goal is to maintain populations of animals in zoos and aquariums for the long term and that's predicated on welfare. So but when we try to manage these populations in limited resources, we have a number of challenges. The primary challenge is that all living things on the planet have evolved to be reproductive for most of their lifespan, uh, if not all of it. And reproduction is arguably the most highly motivated behavior that animals have. Many animals are willing to die for it. Uh, so that's something we grapple with. Genetic management of populations often uh, would ask that we uh, space out reproductive events in an animal's life or at least delay their first reproduction to maintain genetic diversity. We're also grappling with an issue called the use it or lose it phenomenon where we know, and we've known actually since the 40s, that when you slow down reproduction or you delay reproduction, you increase the risk that the animal will not return to fertility or that they will have an increased risk of pathology. Um, we've also just recently in the U.S. done a number of population viability analyses of our zoo populations and we find that the breeding rate is one of the most critical variables in population viability and we're not breeding at a high enough rate. So the use it or lose it may be losing the population as well. Um, contraception options are also uh, limited. There likely always will be and contraception is not without risk or changes or effects to the animals. Um, in the U.S., there's essentially no market for animal contraceptives. The types of animals that dominate the animal market in the U.S. and in the world uh, are lab animals, farm animals, um, and pets. And by and large, we do not contracept those. Uh, there's not enough tigers, lions, or even elephants or feral horses in the world for any pharmaceutical company to invest the resources in developing species-specific contraceptives that are safe, effective, uh, and reversible. The products we do use right now in zoos were uh, developed for a very small number of species, including humans, and we have some significant challenges in adapting those uh, to be safe, effective, and reversible in the very species we manage. In some cases, the products we do use come from very small-scale operations, they may be professional labors of love or second jobs for some people, actually. Um, the last thing is that animals in the wild produce surplus of themselves uh, because natural selection is not on your side and you have to beat the odds. So just because an animal finds itself in the national park now that has boundaries or in a zoo does not mean they will not produce surplus of themselves. So even in tightly controlled breeding programs like we have in zoos, uh, there will be surplus. It's just what animals are going to do. So uh, the, the goal of lifetime reproductive planning is to balance these various goals. We want to maintain high levels of genetic diversity because that's good for welfare. We want to avoid risks of prolonged non-breeding or contraception because we know that's probably good for welfare. We want to provide animals uh, opportunities to engage in highly motivated diverse behavior. We want to ensure our populations are sustainable 
and we do want to minimize the production of surplus animals so that we can avoid situations where animals may be in suboptimal conditions or where we may need to consider culling those animals. So we hope to balance this with lifetime reproductive planning. There's two broad steps in this process. The first one is what we call reproductive viability analysis, where we look back at the breeding recommendations that have been made for a population, and we measure the outcomes looking at the stud book or other um, software that we have here in the US for tracking outcomes. And we characterize successful and unsuccessful pairs in terms of their age, their parity, their reproductive history, rearing history, contraceptive history, all kinds of things. And then we do statistical magic to help figure out what are the predictors of success or failure. We've done these for a few species now. Um, we learned in tigers, or uh, another research group learned that reproductive success in the North American, uh, this may be the global stud book, I'm not sure, sorry, uh, peaks at around age five and then naturally declines. Females who are experienced at, at breeding are more likely to be successful in the future. If a pair is already together at the same institution, those pairs are more successful than if you have to ship one animal to another zoo to set up a, a new pair. Institutional experience with breeding, if you've produced a litter recently, you're more likely to be successful in the future. With fennec foxes, again, we found that experience increases success, and pairs of the same rearing type do better, so two mother-reared animals or two hand-reared animals will be more successful than one of each in a pair. Um, we've also learned with phoenix that their reproductive lifespan is curtailed when you delay reproduction. And we've also done a reproductive viability analysis for Mexican wolves and we find similar kinds of things. So the second step, um, oops, I went backwards. The second step is a vortex model. Vortex is a stochastic simulation model that's individual based um, that helps us make projections about the future. Uh, the models are parameterized by data we get from the stud book, from the, the contraceptive database that we have at the Reproductive Management Center, the outcomes of the reproductive viability analysis, and other things like social structure. And then we can test a variety of scenarios in Vortex and look at their effects. So breeding early and often, breeding once early and then delaying for some period of time, uh, breeding and culling, uh, taking animals out of the active breeding pool to be used in educational or as ambassador animals and then breeding them back in, things like that. The typical kinds of outcomes we get from Vortex are population projections of size and genetic diversity at various time frames in the future. But most important for us is this will help us understand trade-offs between those five goals that, we, that I showed you earlier. Um, when we ran an early model with fennec foxes, we found, for example, one of the questions you have often as an animal manager is when to give up on a pair if they're just not breeding. And we, this model helped us to determine that, that fennec fox pairs need two years of trying. And then after that, waiting longer does not increase your chances of success. So this is just a diagram that portrays several different scenarios that we developed for um, litter-bearing carnivores. So you could look at a scenario where uh, a female uh, breeds early and then is put on contraception and then her reproductive bouts are interspersed with varying kinds of contraception. And then at some point, uh, you either continue that or she might be uh, sterilized. An alternative to that kind of scenario would be continual reproduction early on in life and then uh, permanent contraception or sterilization. Um, but this allows you to evaluate down the line at, each, at the end of each contraception event whether or not it would be beneficial for, the popu for that individual to, to breed again. Um, in this scenario, uh, we breed early at puberty, immediately go on a short-term contraceptive. We come off of contraceptives because we want to avoid certain kinds of side effects of them, but we have to make a decision at that point what is the, the, the uh, genetic value of the litter for the population. So we have to evaluate at each of these steps whether that litter needs to stay in the population, can we place it outside of AZA or outside of our zoological association, or do we need to consider calling that litter? Just a, a diagram of the kind of output you get from Vortex. This is uh, from one of the tiger simulations. I don't know all the specifics of the scenario, but 
what we get is each one of these black lines is a run, is an iteration in the vortex model. Uh, this is time on the x-axis, and so uh, with population size, whatever this scenario was, whatever the breeding regime modeled was, we could maintain a population size uh, stability for 100 years. So our goal is to use these initial model species, like I said, they've been tiger, fennec fox, Mexican wolf, uh, to work out the bugs in some of the models and run a variety of scenarios that we hope will streamline this process uh, in the future for other species. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next on our list is Dr. Sally Sherwin. She's the animal welfare specialist of Zeus Victoria, and she's actually spent some time with Paul Hemsworth um, on previous projects. She's going to tell us something about science and the holistic zoo environment. Sally, where are you? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, yep, I'm Sally. I work at Zoo Victoria, so that's Melbourne Zoo, Werribee Zoo, and Hillsville Sanctuary. Um, back home in Australia. So I'm going to run you over some of our programs that are in place for um, how we integrate science-based management in our, in our three zoos. Jenny's already covered this. So at Zoos Victoria, we have a, um, an ethical framework for de decision-making or ethical decision-making. Three key questions. Um, is captivity justified? Is it humane and is it effective? So the justification at Zoos Victoria and most zoos here would be conservation and education. The humaneness element is all of our welfare work. And the effectiveness is why zoos like Zoos Victoria hire researchers to work there, because it's up to us to back up our practices and what we do with good science. So there's animal, uh, animal welfare scientists, which is me, um, social scientists that look at our conservation programs from the campaign point of view and behavior change of the, of the human visitors, and um, conservation biologists that do the field work for the threatened species programs. So we've developed a um, Zoo Victoria animal welfare model based on um, tweaking various models that exist in the literature. Our ultimate goal is giving animals a good life or a life worth living, which are quality of life um, assessments. And we do have an assessment tool in place that measures this. And it's, um, it's based on some of the livestock animal uh, welfare assessment tools. And we use it um, a range of 18 indicators across physical domains of welfare. And the output is a single welfare score for every single species that lived at our zoo. And we do this once a year. It helps us prioritize. We then categorize based on this score, positive, neutral, and negative. Prioritize our, uh, our resources to shift them up into the positive category. But it also prioritizes our research activity. So I can talk to you guys about that later if you're interested in these kind of assessment tools for your, for your zoos. Um, so central to delivering a good life or a life worth living in, in our zoo animals is providing them with the opportunity to thrive. And so this, what's unique about this is that this is 100% in control of the zoo managers and the zoo keepers and, and the zoo environment and what we provide the animals. Then I worked with David Maller from Massey University to tweak um, his five domains model and incorporate the four physical domains of welfare into our welfare model. Um, I blended health and nutrition into one because this is largely a veterinary thing. Um, so the vets have a lot of responsibility in that domain. And then we added the human-animal interactions um, aspect. And this is, a, this is obviously a massive part of the zoo environment for zoo animals. And um, obviously probably influenced from people like Paul who's just down the road at Melbourne Uni. Um, and we do a lot of research in this physical domain. So this is what we consider the holistic zoo environment that we study. And our animal welfare science is based on these three key environmental variables within the zoo and understanding what the animals want out of these kind of environments. Right, natu natural living paradigm is one of the three conceptual frameworks of animal welfare assessment, along with biological functioning, which are the health and veterinary type measures, and um, affective state, which is the emotional... Um, part of it all. So natural living, I would argue that zoos were um, one of the first animal industries to get to, to nail a lot of this. Um, Hedegaard mentioned it in his book in 1950 where he suggested that environment and husbandry should be based on the natural history of a species and that, that significantly progressed a lot of the housing conditions that zoo animals have. What we focus on, we're doing a bit of work at the moment in investigating this concept a bit further because it hasn't been well studied from a welfare science point of view. So what we're doing with it is really focusing not so much on the natural environment, but on the, the natural behaviours and, and how the environment can stimulate or encourage these natural behaviours. 
we've got an interesting piece of work in progress at the moment with David Mallory again, looking at theoretical paper on natural living and reptiles. So this is a typical kind of zoo enclosure for reptiles, is how they're typically housed. And traditionally, we've referred to them as behaviourally unresponsive, and therefore we don't have a whole lot of welfare or validated welfare measures for reptiles. What David Mallor and I are trying to work on at the moment is maybe we're considering them behaviourally unresponsive because we're giving them behaviourally under-stimulating environments. And so we've got some experiments in progress trying to, to better understand this concept. So stay tuned for some more work on that. Georgia Mason from University of Guelph has done a lot of work in this space of phylogenetic comparative methodology, which gives us a really good head start on what we're working with these species. As Temple mentioned this morning, um, it's really important to know your animal. And natural behavioural biology risk factors tell us a lot about what, how well an animal is likely to do in the zoo environment. We've already got a list of, um, of what we call... Uh, risk predictive factors, and these are things like large home range size, hunting strategy that involves a large um, chase distance, uh, social group in primates, and complex foraging niche. And these can predict poor performance in captivity, so species that have these traits. So this tells us, it, shouldn't, it, it doesn't mean that we don't have species that have these traits, it just means your work is cut out for you if you do, and you need to pay a lot of attention to some of these behaviours. Um, and so this gives us clues that these are inherently rewarding for the animal or important for the animal. But we need to focus on the full repertoire, so the, the behavioural diversity of the animal. And we've, we've introduced this concept into our welfare work to inform, use a bit of science to inform our enrichment programs and our enclosure di design programs using behavioural diversity. This is the formula we use. I don't have time to go into detail, but we can chat about this in the breaks. What we do with this is then we I, I use ethograms, we identify the functional behavioural categories that are important for the animal, um, all the way to the full diversity from rest and relaxation all the way up to the active behaviours. We create an inventory of strategies for the animal that can provide these and then we allocate them and we deliver, we deliver it physically to the animal and then we have to evaluate it with science to see how, how we did with matching their, um, their behavioural diversity of what we expect to see in the wild. This led us to develop a behavioural opportunities matrix to inform our enclosure design. This is an example for a Tassie Devil exhibit that we've um, been working on developing. It's a snapshot of part of their tool where we identify each of these key behaviours and ensure that we provide for them. And also the fun part is creating that inventory of things that we can do to encourage these behaviours and this is where we work with John, Clo John Coe and his um, incredible brain of um, innovative enrichment designs and as a result these Tassie devils and various um, species of our big cat have these complicated plumbing systems throughout their back wall and throughout the ground that deliver food um, in an unpredictable manner both temporary and spatially which is going to be really exciting to see how they go. We also use this principle to um, inform the design of our lead beaters possum. So these guys are potentially going to be going back out to the wild. So we needed to be really specific about what kind of... Um, so this is a local uh, threatened Victorian species. Um, and we need to be very specific about what activities we want them so they, they're going to survive in the wild. And so this is a little gym that's designed... a rotational gym for the possums that's designed to work certain uh, muscles and, and give them opportunities for certain activities. Could watch this for hours, but I better keep moving. It's like a little gladiator gym for them. And as Faye touched on before, we do a lot of work as well in the mental health and fitness as well. So we cover physical health and fitness and behavioural opportunities and mental opportunities for those cognitive challenge. And I stole this term off Faye, the challenge of a challenge. Um, so we do, we've, uh, Faye mentioned we do a lot of work with digital enrichment in our apes and I've chosen the most low-tech example to show you here. This is a giraffe using a puzzle feeder. But as Faye mentioned, and it, and it was brought up a bit yesterday, um, this is a great example of contra freeloading. There's a free carrot on the top here, but Tembi's choosing to work the puzzle feeder to get access to these carrots. And we have a lot of examples like this that we see in the animals. This is a big area of research for us. So we've studied the human-animal interaction in, in, in zoos for over seven years now. And we've got a really good understanding of how enclosure design and species factors influence this. Um, and we've de dedicated a lot of work to this area. We do this experimentally as well. So we, we physically manipulate the conditions that the animal, the visitor conditions that the animals are exposed to, and then we evaluate what goes on with the, within the animal's behaviour and welfare. 
As a result of this, we've got a full range of examples from the negative interactions with the capuchins, penguins, for example, um, and we use these, these changes where we see a negative interaction to inform enclosure design changes or changes in the, in the species environment. A lot of neutral examples where they pretty much ignore the visitors as well. We study this in all species, even our stick insects and our handling programs. So we do a lot of work on close encounter effects of those intense visitor interactions as well, in invertebrates all the way up to the, the higher vertebrates as well. Here's a big one. This is an example of some positive human-animal interactions that we have evidence for, thanks to some of Paul's work, um, with the preference test that showed orangutans choose to interact. Giant tortoises are another one that like a, a, a shell scratch, and they actually position themselves in the enclosure on days when visitors are there to get some scratches. And seals are another example of a positive one. Here's a controversial one. We've got no idea what's going on with the koalas, but there's a lot of research happening at the moment. We've got a project about to kick off to understand um, what is the impact of these koala cuddles that we call them in Australia. We also do a lot of welfare assessment or validation of new tools to, um, to, to look at how the animals are coping. And this, I think technology is a key to advancing a lot of the science in this. So we work closely with some computer scientists and engineers from Melbourne Uni just down the road or other universities in the, in the region. And a couple of examples of what we do here. Um, I noticed with some gorilla research that on days where gorillas were particularly aggressive, they were also particularly smelly. So they, um, they really stunk, that intense BO. Scientifically, this is called volatile organic compound analysis. It's pretty much just the analysis of gorilla BO. Uh, we're working with some engineers and some biochemists to get some um, actual analysis of what these, um, this gorilla BO is and how we can use it as an early predictor for gorilla aggression. Also look for correlations between gorilla smell or BO, um, fecal hormonal analysis of testosterone and cortisol, and also what that means for their emotional state and behaviour throughout the day as well. Some heart rate work, again, um, is based on... Um, Oh, yep, wrapping up. We're doing this in frog skin colour change in heart rate and throat pulse rate. And that's it from me. Any, um, any questions, come and find me in the break. Thank you very much, Sally. Next on our list is Samantha Ward. She's a senior lecturer, which in the US would be the equivalent of an associate professor at Nottingham Trent University. And she will uh, again t talk something about uh, keeper animal interactions and relationships. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so my topic's kind of been touched on um, by a couple of the other speakers that have spoken already in this morning. So it works quite nicely and fits in uh, really quite well. Um, so as zoo professionals, you'll have be seeing uh, quite a lot of similar footage or photographs as to what you see in your general zoo on a daily basis. Um, so with more visitors that do tend to visit the zoos these days, uh, you'll have viewing windows which are quite popular with uh, various crowds. But you'll also have a lot more um, a push now, I suppose, um, for a lot more visitor interactions with the animals. So these could range from uh, the feeding experiences. Um, it could be touching and stroking particular animals, holding them. Um, and now as well, one of the most popular sort of exhibits that we see in the UK is the walkthrough exhibits where the animals are free roaming and the public just walk uh, directly through. One of the other aspects that you'll see quite a lot of in your zoos is your extremely dedicated keepers. Um, and these sort of interactions that happen on a daily basis are a lot more um, intense, I suppose, um, and a lot more uh, close encounters than what you would necessarily associate with your visitors. Okay, so it could just be um, a random little tickle as you're raking up your leaves um, or reaching down and having a really good old scratch of your wombat. Um, it could be um, sort of keeper presentations and education displays uh, with your various members of the public, and it could also be a positive uh, reinforcement training that happens in quite a lot of zoos nowadays. So quite a variety of different interactions, um, which is quite um, key to, to what I'm starting to look at. 
Um, so just to kind of briefly outline what is a human-animal interaction and human-animal relationship, well, the idea is, is as simple as it sounds. It's the causation of a, of a behaviour because of what a human does, potentially. And that develops onto your human-animal relationship with regards to the fact that your animals and your keepers or your animals and your humans are starting to um, recognise and pick up, based on previous interactions, what is potentially going to happen. Um, and that's when you get your, um, your relationships that develop. So in our, in our zoo um, science uh, field, there have been now more numerous studies that have started to look at uh, the visitor-animal interactions. Um, and generally, as a very kind of rough uh, guide, you'll notice that the visitors have either a neutral or a potentially a negative interaction on the animal behaviour and welfare. And these are our unfamiliar uh, humans within our zoo world. Whereas with our keepers, it's very much... Uh, very understudied, should I say. And these are the interactions that happen on a daily basis that are really quite close encounter. And these are the potentials of where really good and strong positive interactions could lead to positive relationships. So as uh, Paul referred to earlier, this is uh, Jeff Hosey's model in 2008. Um, and I'm not going to use the, the little liney thing because it will show how much uh, English tea I've not had this morning. Um, but it kind of highlights that your negative interactions potentially can uh, simulate a no uh, relationship development um, and could potentially be quite indicative of high fear and stress within your animals. Alternatively, you could have those positive interactions which are more likely to develop a positive relationship um, and then potentially low fear and confidence or potentially also quite enriched by the public or the people or the keepers that you're interacting with. Um, so Vicky, Melfi and I put this to the test a little bit. So we started to look into this uh, with regards to uh, keepers and the animal interactions. Uh, and there is now a, a sort of a body of evidence that does suggest that with positive keeper animal interactions, there are positive responses um, that, are, that develop from this. Um, and that actually this, again, based on the, the research uh, from a lot of Paul's work, looking at, you know, does this impact on animal welfare? And we kind of inferred that actually it is very likely to, um, just again because of what's already out there with different species and different um, areas of research. Um, so what we then also looked at um, was sort of the, the, in a little bit more depth and detail, so the keeper-animal interactions and the keeper-animal relationships. Um, so we worked with three different species, across various different uh, locations and zoos and different things like that. Um, and we found that actually uh, some keepers did actually receive quicker responses from the animals than others, um, which certainly suggested to us that there were specific dyads that were formed between keepers and animals. Um, and these interactions were consistent from the keeper and the animal and so it w they were very specific dyads so it was not just that one animal really liked to be with humans it was that one animal really liked uh, or responded better to a certain keeper um, it was that sort of specific um, and we also then started to look at the potential causation of this interaction uh, and sort of started to find that actually it seems to be more the animal that dictates what the interaction is and how this then potentially develops as a relationship, more so than what we initially thought, i.e. it was the human that does that. Um, so again, this is quite new sort of research, which is um, starting to develop in a little bit more, in more depth. Um, so what we then decided that we wanted to start and look at is actually how are we measuring uh, keeper-animal relationships. So it's something that I wanted to really get a good grasp for as you start to look in various literature, so companion, lab, uh, agricultural animals, they all have a variety of different methods as to the way that they think is better to be able to use it within their industry um, and for different sort of techniques as well. So what we wanted to do was to try and identify um, which methods uh, would be more suitable comparing across all the different institute, um, all the different sort of uh, situations to work out what actually is beneficial for zoos and to be able to actually measure those relationships within a zoo setting with your keepers. Um, so again, we don't really have time to sort of go through each component, um, but the way that we looked at this is to start to look at reliability, robustness, accuracy, the practical application, and also the feasibility. So that kind of involves things like the, taking into account the enclosure design, uh, the different types of species, whether they're in mixed species enclosures, walkthrough enclosures, um, whether additional training needed was needed for the staff to be able to conduct these studies. Um, of course, health and safety was a big key uh, aspect uh, with regards to a lot of the, the human-animal relationships and the big differences, I suppose, between potentially lab and, uh, sorry, your companion and your agricultural animals when you're comparing it with, with tigers. So we looked at all of these different aspects 
And we then kind of highlighted um, a three potential methods that could be therefore quite prevalent and quite positively used within the zoos. Um, one of these methods was the latency and the escalation, which is the things that, um, that Vicky and I have developed originally. Um, so that's mainly looking at if when you give a, an animal a cue and how long it takes for that animal to respond. Uh, the escalation component is the potential additional extras that as a keeper you do if your animal's not doing what you want. So it could be that you're encouraging it with food, it could be that you kind of become a little bit more positive, or in some cases it could be that the keeper gets a little bit frustrated and starts to then get a bit more like, oi, come on, this way. Um, so that was one of the methods. Um, qualitative behavioural analysis is a, um, as you probably know as welfare scientists and people that are interested in welfare, a tool that was developed by uh, Professor Francoise Velmsfelder um, up at SAC, um, mainly as a, a holistic welfare assessment tool. Um, so I've been working with her about how we can kind of get this tool to actually be used uh, and be used to analyse and really look at keeper animal relationships as a whole, as a holistic sort of interaction. Um, so that also came up quite uh, positively with regards to our um, uh, one of the methods. Um, voluntary approach was also one that was potentially quite useful because you could do this from behind the protective contact of the bars. Um, and we, again, incorporated this. So what we've then done um, is basically set out to actually test these methods. So again, we've tried to encourage or kind of uh, keep as many different species as possible or include as many different species, should I say. Um, and that, again, incorporates different types of enclosures. It also incorporates different um, sort of carnivores, herbivores, those sorts of aspects. And whether you have um, sort of animals that are within visitor walkthrough ex exhibits um, and visitor feeding exhibits as well. So currently, this is literally data that's kind of come through about three days before I flew out here. So it is very sort of preliminary data. Um, but we've currently collected 11 hours uh, per method per species. And that is just ad lib uh, sort of continual sampling when we've got the keeper animal interactions ongoing. Um, and again, we've got our sort of different scores. So we've got uh, six different components that we're looking at with a maximum of 20 points um, per score. And again, there's different aspects within each of those. Um, so from looking at the data that we currently have, um, it's certainly looking uh, like qualitative behaviour analysis is one of our, going to be a really, really useful tool that we can really start to look at the holistic relationship um, that figures or that works between uh, individual animals and keepers. Uh, the next highest or the very similar uh, was the latency and the escalation scorings, and that's, again, something that I'd done previously. So as you look at and compare across those particular two methods, there are differences and potentially quite significant differences between between some of the components. So practical application with qualitative behavioural analysis, it does involve uh, quite a lot of, of additional work behind the scenes. Um, so what does that kind of leave us? Well, we now know that we have positive keeper animal interactions, and they then lead on to positive uh, animal responses. We now know also that those interactions can lead to specific keeper animal relationships. We now know that these relationships can be appropriately measured within zoos and we can standardise the method that's used, which means that we can compare a lot of the different interactions and the relationships that are across various different zoos, different settings, which now means we can really start to empirically measure the welfare implications of these keeper animal relationships. Um, and there's lots of different settings where this might be quite important. So, for example, uh, moving of animals uh, when they've been within... Um, within relationships, potentially with their keepers over a long period of time, um, and then potentially moving these to different locations and how we're looking at that. Um, and also in some other locations, in some other institutes, they have swing keepers. So they'll work within a section for six weeks and then move on to different sections. So they get more training, which is good for the keepers, but how does that influence on the relationships developed between the animals and the keepers? Um, so there's lots of new areas of research that's now going on. Um, and apparently, I probably don't have time for questions because I've slightly overrun. But yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, we are now going to hear a talk by Jason Waters, who is uh, the Vice President of Wellness and Animal Behavior at the San Francisco Zoological Society, and to some of us in the room, much more important because he's the executive editor of Zoo Biology. Thank you. <clears throat> so this, this session is on uh, advances in animal wel welfare science. And I'd like to sort of, sort of ask the question if we can get new information out of old techniques. We can't always do experiments. Sometimes we actually have to assess how our animals are doing without working through a year-long 
two year long, uh, you know, study. You don't always feel how you look. Take a look at this guy. He's living in a smoky environment. His skin doesn't look too well. His eyes are, I don't know if that's jaundice or bloodshot or what. He's got a glass of something that's probably 70% vodka. And, you know, you might take a look at this and go, this guy, he might not have long left. You know, we, we maybe need to start doing a quality of life analysis on this fella. Um, <clears throat> But if you actually ask him, sit him down and talk to him, he'll tell you, I'm doing pretty well. I'm a rock star. I have an awesome family. I have people who support me. I'm able to do what I want to do. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with what's going on in my life. And this is what we call sort of the, the uh, I can't remember what it's called, the self-report. <laughs> we call this the self-report when we sit somebody down and ask them, how they're doing, and they tell us. Well, we can't really sit down animals and ask them how they're doing, though in, in the, the lab in San Francisco, we're trying to figure out ways to essentially do that. Is this the best way to assess welfare? Is watching your animals the best way to see how they're doing? Um, we tend to think that it might be one of the best techniques out there. We think animals are self-reporting with their behavior and that we're getting better at listening to them. So in San Francisco, we think that sort of balance is welfare. This reflects a lot of what was spoken uh, yesterday in some of the sessions and also earlier today. We, we feel that this sort of the emotional state of the animal is what welfare is. We're looking for animals to have positive sort of experiences or at least a balance between the frequency of positive and negative experiences. So over here on the on that side, what is that? Your left. Um, we might imagine if we have a situation where there's lots of positive opportunities in an animal's day, we have good positive welfare. These animals we might think act optimistically. They might act in an open way. They might be resilient to change. When we have an animal that's out of balance, we might imagine that they act pessimistically are aversive to new stimuli and are particularly sensitive. And so one of the things that we've been doing in our lab is looking for behaviors that reflect balance. We've spent a lot of time over the past, mm, I don't know, four or five years, maybe a little bit longer, looking for these types of behaviors. We think anticipatory behavior in response to known stimuli is a good behavior, uh, a good group of behaviors actually, that help us to understand how animals feel about themselves, their own situation, their state of balance. And we're starting to think that decision making in response to equivocal stimuli may also be cognitive bias, may also be uh, applicable in figuring these sorts of things out as well. In zoos, we might have to do it in a sort of a backwards fashion, but we do that a lot in our lab as we sort of go backwards. Anticipatory behavior is a goal-directed behavior that occurs during the appetitive phase prior to reward acquisition. When do we expect to see it? We expect to see it when positive events are signaled, when daily patterns are consistent. We really expect to see it when animals live in zoos. Daily patterns in zoos tend to be fairly consistent. Keepers tend to be on certain schedules. The positive opportunities that animals have oftentimes fall at the same time of day. What might animals anticipate? They might anticipate food, place, their relationships with their people or with other animals. What does it tell us? It tells us the degree to which animals are reward sensitive. It's sort of their own sense of balance. It tells us how they're feeling about their current state. It represents a reflection of the animal's current environment. It indicates perception of balance. Um, it tells you how important an event is to, to the animal. So you might imagine that if an animal has only a couple of positive opportunities in its day, it, it might find those to be very, very important. At the time that it's occurring, it probably feels good, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's telling us the animal is in a great state of welfare. We have to actually look at it and see what's going on. <clears throat> 
So here's a wacky graph uh, that might give us some idea of what we might expect to see anticipatory behavior-wise. So if we're in a situation where we have lots of positive opportunities in our day, we might not expect anticipatory behavior, any particular bout of anticipatory behavior, to be particularly intense. But because we have a lot of opportunities, we might have lots of small bouts of anticipatory behavior. Over here, when we're getting less balanced, if you will, or more towards a negative setting, we might expect that individual bouts of anticipatory behavior are relatively intense, but that there are fewer of them in the day because there are just simply fewer good things to look forward to. So in, in terms of some predictions, to borrow from sort of chemical nomenclature, I'm calling this sort of the concentration of a bout of anticipatory behavior, if you will. If we're living in an environment that supports positive, holy moly, If we're living in an environment that supports positive welfare, we might not expect anticipatory behavior to be particularly outrageous in any particular bout. On the other hand, if we really need something good, we're going to demonstrate that we really want it. In a good environment, we might expect that there's some sort of low-grade amount of anticipatory behavior going on almost constantly if there's lots of good positive things to see. We might imagine that in this case, anticipation is just a part of the sort of daily schedule of events for an animal, and we might not necessarily see it pop out very easily. However, if we have a, a poor environment and only a few number of things that are signaled that indicate to the animal that something good is about to happen, we might see strong responses of anticipatory behavior. What's it look like? Well, we've been starting to sort of take a look at what anticipatory behavior looks like in our lab. It's often described as an increased activity at the onset of a cue that indicates a coming reward. It might be increased locomotion. Sometimes it might look like a sort of a mindful pacing. And it also might have other appearances as well. It might just be staring at a certain area where something is likely to occur. We think this behavior shows promise to indicate the value of an event as well as the overall state of welfare from the animal's perspective. We think it could be a self-report. So moving on to sort of decision making, let's think a little bit about cognitive bias. Cognitive bias tests often ask the animal a couple of things. If we train the animal to uh, sort of understand that underneath the green thing is something very good, a diamond in this case, and underneath the red thing is something not so good, not a diamond. <laughs> we can then ask animals with different sorts of states of welfare, positive or negative, what do you do when you come across an equivocal cue, something that you don't know what it will provide? And so that's the question that these tests tend to ask. <clears throat> And if we set a situation up where we have a positive welfare animal and a negative welfare animal and ask them, what do you do with the red thing? They don't do anything. They know something bad is under there after they've been trained to it. What do you do with the green thing? Well, they both move, move over to that and get the positive reward, but they might do it in slightly different ways. So consider that. And what do you do with the equivocal cue that you don't know what is under there? Well, the one that's in a good state of welfare might check it out because it's curious and has this sort of optimistic perspective. And the one that's in a poorer state of welfare might avoid it and act as if it's being pessimistic. So we think these two types of behavior reflect a sort of cumulative welfare from the animal's point of view. And we've recently started talking about how we might be able to mash them together into a sort of a new model that looks at, again, sort of welfare state mapped here this time on two axes, frequency of positive events, frequency of negative events. We might expect when we're in a positive zone here, we have this decreased concentration of anticipatory behavior, but on top of that, and that's in response to known cues, in response to an equivocal cue, these individuals might act as if they are optimistic and go and check that thing out. In response to 
over here, a known cue, we should see a vigorous anticipatory response, but less interest in equivocal cues. So it's really important, I think, to understand what these cues are and to know how animals might be responding to these two things. So knowledge of whether or not the animal is aware of the cue and what it leads to or not is going to help us to actually tease out these two behaviors that actually sometimes might look similar and reflect underlying uh, things in different ways. So we can assess animals' perception of their own psychological state within the pattern of their day. These two behaviors, I think, are indicators of the animal's own sense of balance. Thanks. I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, final presentation will be given by uh, Robert Young, who is Professor of Wildlife Conservation at the University of Salford, which is near Manchester. Robert. Hello. Yeah. Is it working? Okay. Okay, thank you. So. What I'm going to do is talk a little bit about some of my uh, research. Thank you to Stephanie and Detroit Zoo for um, inviting me to come. Here's my obligatory plug for my book. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these topics here. Um, why is it always old fat guys that want to streak for tigers? I don't know. Okay, so... But before I talk a little bit about some of my research, I just want to make a few comments. I've been working with zoos and animal welfare for more than 25 years, yeah? And, you know, it's a journey that we're taking with the animals. So if we think about, you know, London in 1828, it was like economy class on the plane, yeah? So, you know, impinging all of the five freedoms, yeah? Comfort, hunger, thirst, yeah? Clearly, you know, we know that animals didn't survive, yeah? We were getting our animals over and over again from the wild. And zoos have moved on towards, you know, maybe they're aiming more towards this Etihad model of the residence where you have your three rooms and your butler, except for our animals. They don't have a butler, they have a keeper, and they don't have a chef, they have a nutritionist, yeah? I think we need to be very careful where we're going with this journey. Is this necessarily where we should be going with our zoo animals and their enclosures? Are they not just becoming over-pampered? Is this really going to be helpful towards conservation? It might be good for welfare, but if we're thinking about conservation, as a conservation biologist, I spend half my time working in the field. I'm not convinced over-pampering the animals in this way is necessarily the best thing. So people's attitudes to animal welfare are very schizophrenic. I've shown these slides hundreds of times and asked people, what would you do? And they say nothing. And I ask them why, and they say, because it's natural. And then I say, but if that mouse was your daughter's hamster, what would you do? And they all say, oh, I'd run out and save it. Yeah? And I say, well, the suffering of the animal is still the same. So why are you not bothered? And interestingly, Ray Ings and myself, back in the 1990s in Edinburgh Zoo, we asked members of the public what they thought about live feeding of prey to zoo animals. And we asked them, you know, if the zoo was to feed a rabbit live to a cheetah. And, you know, the interesting thing was that nobody who objected to it said they were worried about the prey animal. They all said because it would upset me or it would upset my children. Yeah, so people have very strange attitudes in relation to animal welfare. I just want to comment. We've heard quite a few people um, advocating that zoos should be sanctuary. This is wrong. We need sanctuaries and zoos. This is not pastor or chicken, yeah? We need both. Um, I'm slightly concerned that, you know, some of the conversations I've heard, that this is new welfareism. Yeah, this is people trying to bring in an animal rights agenda through the back door. And so, you know, sanctuaries are wonderful. Um, do great work. I'm a great fan of Animal Asia. They, um, they have one of the best environmental enrichment programs I've ever seen. Um, but remember, they're managing individuals to extinction. Zoo are about saving species from extinction. This is about cleaning up the mess that we as a species have made. Okay, so functions of the modern zoo, we all know what they are. 
And they're all underpinned by good animal welfare or excellent animal welfare. If we don't get the welfare right, we can't do anything in terms of education, research, conservation. You know, these are fundamental things. One of the big issues has been that we've not really got a grip on what we should be talking about when we're talking about good welfare. Zoos kind of pretend that, you know, good welfare is up here all the time. This is completely unrealistic. Whose life is like that? Disney is a film, yeah? Nobody lives a Disney life. Facebook is not real. People are only happy and smiley in social media land. Everybody's life has ups and downs. Sorry, you can see I can't multitask. I'm a man, so I'm completely hopeless. Yeah? So zoo animals, we would expect them to have ups and downs, and this is one of the issues about animal welfare, yeah? Your visitors to the zoo will understand this because their own lives have ups and downs. This is exactly what we see in wild animals as well. And we see when wild animals have more downs than ups, it has very adverse consequences for them. So what we obviously need to make sure is that the life of a zoo animal has more ups than downs. Yeah? That's the important thing that we need to be you know, aware of. So just talk a little bit about research. You know, people talk about personalized health care, and you know, the goal ultimately will be personalized welfare because we're individuals. Animals are individuals. As Temple Grandin pointed out, some animals seek more than other animals. Yeah? So we'll need to look at these issues. There's some very nice research going on in humans, for example, which shows that... Have any of you got a friend who's completely bomb-proof? Doesn't matter what happens to them. They don't get distressed. Yeah? We now know why because they have a certain polymorphism for a certain gene. If they have that, then it doesn't matter what happens to them, they just don't get depressed, okay? We can already identify people who are more at risk. So, you know, these are the kind of things that we'll be able to do with animals before very long. And one of the things that's becoming increasingly more apparent is epigenetics, so how genes are switched on and off by the environment that we're in. So. If you have certain experiences, it can have quite traumatic effects on you. So if we look here, we've got mice. They're exposed to a predator or not exposed to a predator. And we can see that this actually has very strong effects on the behavior and well-being of their offspring. Okay? It almost appears like we've got Lamarckian inheritance going on here. One of research projects I'm at the moment putting together with some geneticists and some immunologists is looking at epigenetic effects in primates. And so we're going to be looking at the same species housed in zoos, living in the streets and cities in Brazil, living in people's back gardens, living in farms, and living um, in the wild. And we're going to see what genes have been switched on by those environments and see how that changes their behavior, their well-being, and things like that. One of the things that we do know already from a lot of studies on epigenetic effects is that the early life is critical. These genes for heightened stress responses, for example, they can be switched on in the sperm and eggs, right? Even before an individual is created, they can already be programmed if their parents were in a stressful environment to have a heightened stress response. One of the other things we're looking at, and very nice, I heard Temple Grandin talk about her work um, with Emil King. We were looking at canids, and we're looking at the difference between biological aging and uh, biological aging and chronological aging. So where animals are actually aging much quicker than they should be. And again, we're doing this with wild animals. We're looking at wild canids. We're looking at canids in zoos as well, and we're looking at dogs. So we've got a whole range of populations. And that we're doing this is by looking at our images and also measuring a thing called um, telomere health, which is how quickly the telomeres, these are the ends of your chromosomes, are actually shortening. If they're shortening very rapidly, then that indicates you're aging very quickly biologically. The interesting thing about telomere health is that, in fact, with humans, we know that if a person leads a very healthy lifestyle, even though they might have major life-changing events, such as divorce, death, they can actually slightly increase their telomere length, which suggests that looking after well-being is, you know, really, really a good thing in terms of longevity and things like that. And here's my obligatory picture, yeah, of a, not a rock star, but somebody local, yeah. How old does Eminem look in this picture? If you put him on one of your apps, it'll say he's 50. 
he's actually 40 in this picture, yeah? So he's aging because of his lifestyle much faster than his biology. So his, bi uh, his biological age is much higher than his chronological age. And this woman here, she's a model from South Korea. She's actually 42. She has a 21-year-old daughter. Okay, so one of the other things I'm looking at um, in our research at the moment, we're looking at sleep disruption because we know that sleep is a very good indicator of well-being. Okay, and to do all these, we're using a range of technologies from wearable technology, thermal monitoring, automatic monitoring of behavior. So getting rid of problems at the expense of doing these studies through having it automated. So I'm doing a lot of work with engineers to do this. Um, one thing I would like to comment on here is um, people talking about faces, expressions. In the UK, Leach has been de developing pain indexes based on grimaces, and these are now published, so we can analyze pain. Yep, I'm just finishing. And so, and there's a whole host of technology available now to us so that we can um, measure animal welfare. And so, you know, what I'd finish off by saying is that, you know, animal welfare is about cumulative lifetime experiences for the animals. And there's a whole host of new ways that we can measure this and look into it. And it will benefit not just animals, but also humans. Thank you. Mike? Yes, okay. So that was the last presentation I was going to say from a very youthful Rob Young masquerading as a slightly experienced gentleman. Um, <clears throat> a quick summary instead of some questions because we haven't got the time. Um, as you saw at the last uh, two presentations, something that's really important that is very rarely discussed in the context of animal welfare is resilience. Uh, Jason Waters described this in the uh, context of anticipatory behavior, and he struck a balance, or a, a emphasized the point of balance, and that has a very well-known correspondence in the physiological world when we talk about homeostasis. Um, the point that Rob Young just made that I think is really important is there is a trade-off between pampering animals uh, and conservation goals. And um, natural life, therefore, with its ups and downs, and any field behavioral ecologists like myself would agree with that. Those animals uh, face things that zoo animals usually do not have to face. Uh, the other things that uh, we've learned in the session is that lifetime planning is really important because it also uh, requires the collation of evidence on some of the factors that promote reproduction. And the interesting thing about that is some, some of the things that um, uh, David Powell presented that is not even known from field studies. So, for instance, the, uh, the question of experience and the importance of experience is not very clear, even from uh, long-lived species such as um, carnivores, primates, and so on. Then, uh, keeper-animal relationships is a new thing. Um, I think this is a really important and neglected study. We've learned that it's a key to a, it could be a key to animal welfare and success, and that perhaps even animals are shaping these relationships. From a not very um, um, scientific, evidence-based approach, uh, some of you know that my personal obsession are spotted hyenas. I can uh, get to know a spotted hyena keeper in a European zoo or anywhere else in the world, and I can tell you how the hyenas in that zoos are feeling keeping well, because uh, in this species, at least, keepers are really the key, and they most definitely have relationships, so I think that's really worth pursuing. Uh, and finally, the cognitive enrichment also relates to something else. Olfaction is the neglected dimension in the welfare issues in mammals, at least. There's, of course, many other animal classes where olfaction is important, but particularly the mammals. Your average mammal is neither particularly visual nor acoustic, but they live in an olfactory environment, and we neglect this at our peril. I hope you had... Uh, an impression of where today's research in animal welfare that is related to zoos is based. I think it's a really exciting development. In some ways, we're just starting. Um, and I hope um, you will uh, join me in thanking all the seven speakers for really thought-provoking and interesting presentations. Thank you.